just to see me stand over my bed, disbelieving what they see. They say I must be one of the wonders. Here we are at the first ever International World Intersex Meeting. Woo! Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> How does it feel to be here, Mani? It feels um, absolutely incredible to have come all the way from New Zealand for the first day of a gathering. Yep. How did you find out about the Intersex Society? Um, I found out through a friend in New Zealand who had been to a conference here in New Zealand and then I got sent a photocopy of the newsletter and it was like the most, yeah, that, the memory of that was just absolutely incredible, of ending the isolation. So you're intersex? Yes, I am. Thanks. And more than that, I mean, through a process of working on this for four years, um, I identify as third gender. And, and what about you, Angela? Um, I came here, <laughs> I, okay, I found the Intersex Society, um, a couple months ago in April, this is August, September, and in April, um, a friend of mine who, in whom I'd confided some really sketchy details about my surgery and about my experience of, um, of my body, she um, had the newsletter, Hermaphrodites with Attitude, cross her desk. Hermaphrodites with Attitude? That's right, cross her desk <laughs> at the Springfield, <laughs> Illinois Center for Independent Living. And, um, and she somehow made the connection, because of what she read there, um, that it might have something to do with me. And, and, and quite serendipitously, <laughs> Just a few months earlier, I had gotten some of my medical records and, and had only recently begun to make any sense of them. Um, so uh, it all happened. In, Are you in, a hermaphrodite with attitude? I'm a hermaphrodite with major attitude. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, it's incredibly momentous and um, awe-inspiring. I mean, think, the first time ever. Here we are. Like, we're not all here right now, but 10 hermaphrodites in one place. Has this ever happened before? I don't know. It's great. Um, well, I'm incredibly happy to be here. Um, I found out um, through a local article in San Francisco and started getting the newsletter and finally started feeling a sense of identity that I'd never really felt before. Um, what I felt was an identity of isolation, mainly. <laughs> and so changing that to um, being mirrored by people. Um, what did you feel isolated about? Um, about my hermaphroditic status, <laughs> about my um, ambiguous genitalia which um, I'd never found anyone who um, you know, had a body like mine. And the only time I had someone in the medical establishment refer to it, it was in a shaming, you know, patronizing manner. Um, so, um, yeah, I was just trying to find out through personal experience, through a friend who's a gynecologist, like whether or not she'd ever run into people like me and had really come to feel that um, I knew that there were um, people like me out there, but I just didn't know what the chances were of ever finding them. <laughs> it's not something you can ask somebody in any kind of conversations. Um, so, so this has been, yeah, just like a turning point for my life. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> oh, geez, where do I start? <laughs> oh, it's just it's really overwhelming uh, to be here with other people that have just, you know, found the group in, say, the last six months. I uh, first made contact with ISNA in May of 
95 through a uh, going to a speech in Oregon that Ann Fausto Sterling gave and got and talked to her afterwards and uh, she passed my information along to Cheryl and Cheryl got a hold of me and it was like oh my god the seclusion is finally over it's like you know growing up um, I went to this real um, went through this counseling program to help me adapt it was more like brainwashing sessions to make me accept that I'm a normal little girl whose ovaries didn't develop properly is that true no I'm a 35 year old male pseudo hermaphrodite whose testes did not develop properly in utero and therefore gave me an undetermined sex ambiguous genitalia uh, birth and of course they sat there and ran their blood tests and then basically lied to my parents and forced and coerced them into letting the doctors perform you know plastic surgery and 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 giving me uh, female hormones at puberty and basically encouraging me to believe the lies that the doctors were telling me all this time. Doctors lied to you? Surprising. To Surprisingly. <laughs> <laughs> Someone's all called Ted Cabo. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> but it's, um, I mean, and it's been really hard. It's like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but um, I mean yeah they lied to me and telling me that I was a normal little girl uh, they lied to me when they told me that my ovaries hadn't developed properly um, and so there was just this this great amount of shame I mean I remember them removing my penis when I was five. They removed your penis? Oh, I'm sorry, it wasn't a penis, it was an overly large clitoris. They removed your clitoris? Well, they reduced it in size to more closely approximate a normal female appearance. Does it approximate a normal female sensation? No. At least not with the uh, people that I've talked to. And comparing my erotic response with theirs. How do you feel about the fact that was done to you? At times I feel like hiding in the closet because it's like how can anybody accept uh, somebody who's been this mutilated and this, you know, who can accept damaged goods? And at other times I want, I get really, I get so mad that I just want to get a, a dull rusty knife and start hacking off other doctors' genitals and say, Here, you son of a bitch, how do you, now, how do you think it feels? Wow. Well, is, what's your story, David? You know, Heidi's telling us that she was assigned female. What does it feel like to be assigned male? Um, I never knew any different. Um, I was, you know, I was always led to believe I was male. I was led to believe mainly through silence that there was nothing um, nothing wrong with me, nothing I could talk about even. Um, no one ever spoke to me at all uh, about my, my state, my condition. Um, and this is um, one of the amazing things about being here at this retreat is um, to hear so many people telling my story over and over again. Um, They're telling your story? Yeah, the the pattern is is so amazingly similar and we all come from very different places and very different backgrounds and very different bodies and yet our experience is remarkably coherent um, and that I, you know, I find that amazing and, and uh, uh, liberating really to, to finally find out um, that you know I'm not alone um, it's it's extraordinary really did you have genital surgery um, I did um, although uh, it was not called uh, reconstructive surgery or anything like that um, I had a gonad moved um, and I believe I had uh, hypospadias repair 
um, although I have no record on that. Um, I was never told anything about it. Um, and uh, in fact, even though I have, I believe I've recovered all the medical records I'm probably ever going to find, uh, they still really don't say anything, um, which uh, is kind of, I think, kind of remarkable. Um, uh, either through uh, a, a profound state of ignorance, which I find hard to accept, or a denial. You know, um, I recently had uh, one of my doctors say to me, "Well, you know, why not? Why, but but perhaps they didn't want to make an issue of something that they felt they could do nothing about." Um, you know. Of course, there was a lot they could have done about it. They could have at least told me about it. So, uh, with Heidi, they lied to you, and, and with you, David, they just didn't tell you anything? Didn't tell me anything. Anything at all. Um, and they lied in, in the way that when I asked for uh, information, they denied that they had any information. Um, and Which I, I still find remarkable, actually. What would you do if it was your child? Love him love them. Uh, what else can you do? Uh, you know, I think first you have to love someone. Then if changes are going to be made, that's something different. Um, yeah. My name is Max, and um, speaking of babies, uh, along with Leslie Feinberg, I'm, I'm really looking forward to the day when a child is born, you know, people put a I don't know, yellow sign on the front lawn that says it's a baby instead of it's a boy or it's a girl. Um, I want, um, I want uh, anyone hearing this, watching this, um, to know um, that for intersexuals to come together is an incredibly um, powerful and moving and especially healing experience. And the doctors who told me that it would be inappropriate um, for me to talk to other intersexuals were just plain wrong. And, and I want anyone watching this, be they, um, you know, historians or doctors or intersex people, wh whomever, um, I, wa I want you to know that we are just the tip of the iceberg. You know, we are 10 people gathered together in Northern California, but it's just it's just the beginning and I can just feel how this is going to grow and uh, and, and we're going to change um, the way that we're the way that we're treated the way that um, I mean the way that we were treated can never be changed and we'll, we'll carry those scars with us but um but we can make um we, we can make the world uh, you know a better place uh, as Leslie Feinberg wrote to me recently um, a, a new world is in in birth and uh, I really believe that Me too. <laughs> Not gonna hide. Hi, I'm Tom. I, I'm the real hermaphrodite. These these people are all imposters. I didn't come here to be insulted. <laughs> no. I'm just hold it down here. It doesn't need to be on your mouth. Okay. It's a clip on. Yeah, I've known Cheryl through correspondence for maybe a couple of years. Mm, I lose track. Maybe three years. Yeah came across her, one of her articles by chance. Uh, I'm a hypospadiac monster. <laughs> and uh, I went through a surgery thing. Uh, it wasn't my idea. But anyway, I was, uh, I was told it was a hernia. So actually, I'm really a hernia patient. I don't, so that's why they, they covered it up. But, uh, Anyway, I'm glad this, this is kind of strange. I'd imagined these kind of, there's, I thought I was the only one, but I didn't know, maybe. For such a long time, I was, uh, I knew there was something wrong. I mean, there's something <clears throat> that wasn't quite right. Um, but there was a, I, it took me quite a while to figure out exactly what, uh, what it was. When I got uh, the, the word hypospadiac was dropped inadvertently, my parents. So, after looking it up in the encyclopedia, it referred me to the M section, which, under monster, said, ah. 
What would you have liked them to do to you? Uh, nothing at all. Just left me alone. I wish people would have just stopped helping me. But, uh, anyway, it was a... I'm still not sure what the intentions were, whether they're really just mistaken good intentions or sometimes I feel like my parents were like or like people who cut off the legs of their children that they might stand taller in the eyes of the world uh, they were always impressed with the with their position towards uh, people outside their public image kind of sorry to think that but uh, anyway this is it's a little strange. I'd imagine these, I'd be meeting some people like me eventually. And, uh, hmm, may have come about. So are, so are these people, people that you feel are like you? Yes, I do. I was gonna say, um, They're all crazy. Uh, when I was talking to the doctors this last Christmas season, and finally got the honest to God truth from them, uh, part of the original diagnosis, other than um, having a, you know, undetermined sex, uh, part of the problem was that I had micro penis that was also hypospadic, and so it's like I had three strikes right there. I had a, a a too small penis that had a hole somewhere other than at the end, and I had feminized, you know, a a, a, a more feminine looking partially fused scrotal sac than having this nice little healthy, you know, penis and, and scrotum and testes and everything that was all where it was supposed to be. And it was like, it's like, why? Why do they insist on fixing things? So, so what would you have liked them to do for you? What would you do for, for a child who was born like you? I would leave them the hell alone unless there was a a proof of dire consequences if things weren't if some kind of intervention wasn't taken. Let them. I mean, don't uh, let them grow up to like five, six, or seven, and then all of a sudden start mutilating their body and taking things away that they've grown accustomed to having. But of course they removed my testes when I was seven months old because, well, due to possible future cancerous, you know, growth, and there's also in my records where it says, and also to prevent a possible masculinizing puberty. Like, oh my god, we can't have this, l this little girl that we're brainwashing into thinking that she's a normal little girl growing up and hitting puberty and all of a sudden becoming a boy. It's like they need to, to deal straight with the parents, uh, deal straight with the kids when the kids start asking questions, and stop the lies. Did you have something to add to that, money? Well, I'm just sitting here realizing that this is a historic moment, um, and this is about breaking the secrets and lies. I was born in 1953. Um, my mum had lost three children and I was the product of her being given male hormones and there was a intravenous transfusion of the hormones. Um, the first words that were uttered by the attendant nurse when I was born because it, it happened in a hurry was, oh my god it was hermaphrodite. So I was actually labelled <laughs> the only time the first few seconds after my birth. I was born with both a penis and what everyone assumed was a vaginal opening. I've only actually found out just this year that it wasn't. It was a urogenital sinus. Um, I was raised as a male child for the first year. That was common practice in New Zealand then. And my sex was identified as was many hermaphrodites. Can you hold this for a second? That was the test to see which gender I was going to be assigned and because males can't have uteruses um, my sex assignment was changed to female. I did not have the surgery however to change or feminize that part of my body until I was eight. 
It was done in a hospital in total secrecy. I was taken there and dropped off by my parents who did not tell me why I was in hospital or what was going to happen. It was done in a male ward, but I was in a little tiny room off the side of the ward. Um, before the operation, I had, I don't know how many doctors and people come to um, look at the freak. And I was taken into a, a teaching theater, um, not sedated. And the surgeon who was going to do the operation on me actually did it and explained to everybody. Um, I'd been raised in a family where I was not allowed to talk about it, where I was not allowed to show anybody, and the confusion of lying there on the table with all these people looking at me. Um, I've had other operations. I have had my ears removed and reduced in size and made smaller. I've had operations on my face to feminize me. And for the people who watch this film in the future, I just hope that by the time some years has passed that this practice of mutilating um, little children stops and that we're allowed to live who we are unmutilated and, and we make the decisions about how that's going to be and I want to thank this person here who is responsible for all of us sitting here on this rug here in California this afternoon Actually, I have a question for all of you, you know, you've, you've told us that you were treated very badly it sounds by your doctors were these doctors who didn't have any experience with intersex? Or is this the way that specialists treat intersex children? Um, I believe in my situation I was probably one of the first operations performed in New Zealand but I know that nothing has changed, that, that exactly the same procedure is being deployed right now. How about you Angela? I can um I can attest to how the doctors that I were taken to in Peoria, Illinois in 1985 um, was first my pediatrician who referred us to a pediatric endocrinologist at the University of Illinois Medical Center in Peoria um, who I now know studied under um, under a, a doctor another pediatric endocrinologist at Northwestern who had himself studied under the illustrious John Money um, so so there's a, I mean, you can see the genealogy where, I mean, there's John Money and he taught the next generation and he taught the next generation, my doctors, who were women. Um, and so this, this, I mean, Hopkins is where this all comes from, this whole practice. And so it's like straight from the top. You know, this is not unusual that I had my clitoris taken away from me without my knowledge. Well, they say that they just make it smaller. That's what they say. Um, I, I, you know, I didn't have any measurements at the time. Um, I didn't, sh I didn't present any physical ambiguity until I was 12 years old. I was as assigned and raised a girl, and when I was 12, um, my clitoris started to grow, um, and I knew that other girls probably weren't experiencing exactly the same changes in their bodies, but I experienced it as normal anyway, and. Um, and like I said yesterday, which is very difficult for me to say, I not only noticed it, I not only noticed its size growing more prominent, but I loved it. You know, I had this wonderful relationship with it. Um, I, I think of that time that I had maybe, may, maybe six months before surgery, from the time that I noticed it and started to love it to the time that it was taken from me, is like this um, time in the pleasure garden before the fall, you know. Um, that was 1985. It's only 11 years ago. Yeah. I wanted to add this is the specialist. <laughs> Hi. Um, my name's Hida, and um, all the stories that people are telling show how there has been a very deliberate effort, um, a very deliberately institutionalized effort to alter um, occurrences. Um, in people's anatomy and how they're born um, and I was fortunate enough to somehow escape surgery um, and I just want to say I um, hearing Angela's story it's um, my body has been one of the things that I've had the most um, positive feelings about my entire life um, 
just throughout my childhood and as my body developed, I um, always felt extremely comfortable in my body, um, liked the, the changes in my body, loved my clitoris and um, the other aspects, never minded not having large breasts or any of that. And um, the only problems, I mean, the problems that I have experienced have been around this need, um, you know, living in a society that has a need to polarize gender into male or female. And the constant um, subtle and um, at sometimes not so subtle pressures to conform to that um, polarized um, notion of gender, which has been um, ideologically naturalized. And, um, you know, the word normal comes up a lot. And I like to not use that word because finding this group is just um, affirming what I was coming to know just from information. Um, the Five Sexes article was one of the first um, things that I read, which finally spoke to my reality. Um, you know, what I experienced as gender was not a polar male or female. I really didn't feel that my body um, fell into the categories that I read were male or female. And that is what that were, you know, assigned normal status. And um, although I felt very happy with my body, um, I've always also, um, just for the medical establishment out there, had excellent health. Um, doctors have frequently commented on how good my health is. Um, very, very rarely get sick or anything, but it's an aside. But um, I don't know, that's, that's what I want to say. Um, to anyone listening who has escaped surgery and to those who still argue for surgery that um, the problem is not with um, the child. <laughs> um, you know, the problem is with the attitudes toward the child. Um, you know, and even before I, um, as I said, it was my, um, a gynecologist who first mentioned um, that I wasn't normal, that she should perform tests on me because of my clitoris size and that something was going on that was not normal. And um, she had a very discriminatory attitude toward me, which is very easy for me to perceive. Um, she wasn't friendly. She wasn't acting like um, a provider who was interested in my best interests and my um, care, you know, emotional, psychological care. She wanted to fix what she considered a technical abnormality and so I strayed away from that but um, as I've been telling people every other reference to um, my body um, from my first exposure to the word hermaphrodite um, to people's comments you know people noticing differences has been very positive for me unlike what um, you know psychologists or psychiatrists think will happen you know it's it's my reality and I love my body and myself and what um, people need is to have that reality accepted and not, you know, medically, surgically removed or ideologically removed. So that's, that's what I want to say. Mm. <laughs> um, I just like to, um, to say that um, all the people that I've told, that I've talked to as an adult, of course, I didn't have the option of talking to people as a child since I didn't have anything to talk about that I knew have been very supportive and very accepting and I have not met yet a single person who has um, you know shamed me or hurt me um, which is kind of a remarkable thing because of course that's what what we always imagine will happen if you tell anybody you know that you'd be so unacceptable so that it's very encouraging um, if you speak the truth to people usually they respond I mean certain people the right people <laughs> you know they, they, they people that treat this insist that it would be unthinkable to leave somebody untreated with the intersex condition. But here we all are talking about it and embracing it and even appearing on video. <laughs> I think it's really amazing. It is amazing. I, and I was going to say and another thing that people need to realize is that in this mad rush to correct this freak of nature Doctors are currently performing genocide. They are eliminating a race of people who are born different than others. And, I mean, people get up in arms when they talk about the genocide of Hitler and 
the insane bullshit that Napoleon did. And I mean, all of, you know, Idi Amin and, and just listening, all of these mean, evil dictators who were really corrupt. We need to take a look at what's happening in our own backyards at the people that are being silenced and eliminated, not so much by being put to death, but by having something removed from their bodies that sets them apart as being different. And it's just, like I said, it at times I just get so frustrated and so angry. It's like, I just, I want to go out and kill something, but that's not going to fix the problem. And so I need to redirect that anger and that energy into a more constructive uh, form of activism and the stuff that we've been planning this weekend is like, I can't wait. Um, I guess I'd like to address what you're talking about, about, um, about being in the midst of a genocide. And, and I agree that we're not being killed off uh, physically, but but there is something vital that's being taken from us, and and I know from the experience of my very own body that um, I mean I know <laughs> the the really wonderful sensitivity um, that I had before surgery. I'm talking, you know, um, in terms of genital sensation and the tremendous orgasms that I had before, and how that experience as I remember it is even different from um, from from how other women have explained to me their experience of their bodies um, and I use that phrase other women in a really kind of precarious way um, and so it's very painful for me to think of how to conceptualize that what's been taken is a very specific um, eroticism, you know, like a, a hermaphroditic eroticism that that must really scare people and really cause a great deal of anxiety. Um, and it's just a really special part of of whatever um, of whatever culture that that we have developed individually and are bringing together, you know, that that special part, our sexuality, that sacred sexuality. Um, has been ripped from us, and and I don't want to say, you know, I'm wary of saying that um, that I don't have the kind of genital sensation that I did, because that doesn't mean that I don't have great sex, you know. Um, it does it does in fact mean that I have uh, a not a not as reliable sexual response, and um, but but most importantly, it means that that very special form of um, of sexuality and arousal and all of that that was uniquely hermaphroditic was taken. And that's the crime. Newspapers ask intimate questions, want confessions. They reach into my head to steal the glory of my story. They say I must be one.